in today's uh, postdoc workshop. Uh, I have the great pleasure of being able to introduce uh, Dr. Laura Kramer uh, today. Uh, Dr. Kramer was a professor em emeritus. She is a professor emerita at uh, Montclair uh, College, uh, or Montclair State University uh, in New Jersey. Um, she's uh, done a variety of things. She's got a PhD in uh, sociology from uh, uh, SUNY Stony Brook, Steve. There's another Stony Brook alumni in the, in the audience. Uh, but uh, she's also uh, written books, I get the title right, The Sociology of Gender, a brief uh, intro. Uh, the reason that uh, uh, she's here today is I re received a request from the postdocs about uh, addressing this issue of, of diversity and unintended consequences that drive you away from diversity. And uh, when I got that, that invitation, actually, uh, Laura came to mind. Laura works with my wife, Son Sonia, down here uh, at the National Science Foundation for a while. She was a program director for the ADVANCE program, which is a program at NSF that's still running that's designed to advance uh, uh, gender diversification within uh, the, the STEM fields. So she was program director for that. And then also for a few years after that, uh, she's done what I think is, e is even more important, perhaps, is evaluating whether these uh, uh, proposals actually uh, succeeded. So it's one thing to review a proposal and promise to do things. It's another one to actually see if these uh, procedures are implemented. So today, uh, I'm pleased to say Laura's going to be talking about unintended equities in professional settings, recognizing and remediating common Anybody hearing me? OK, good enough. Um, good morning. I'm pleased to be here. And I hope you'll find my presentation of some use. Because we're being videotaped, I'll postpone a real conversation among us until after I've laid my thoughts out for you. I want people to feel freer to speak openly than they might if the camera were still rolling, to use an old image. If you have questions, feel free to let me know, but my questions for you will wait. Before I begin, let me state some basic assumptions I make about our shared values and expectations. They'll be obvious, but I think it's best to start by making them explicit. I do hate PowerPoint, but I use it a little bit, because uh, you have to, you're required to. Um, basic beliefs. Uh, an individual's professional performance should be judged fairly. Career paths should be influenced by relevant abilities, uh, effort that's actually made, and performance. On the other hand, the career path should not be influenced by others' views about whether or not you fit in because of a social identity. By social identity, I mean um, statuses like gender, race, ethnicity, sexuality, age, uh, various disabilities. Uh, are you uh, married? Do you have children? And so on. Um, let me note uh, that in my conceptual approach, I see people um, with, with social identities that have been viewed as not really fitting in a certain milieu or a certain role in that milieu um, as people who are marginal. It's a marginal status. You're not quite a member of that group. You're not quite a member of the group you come from because you've left it to, to do a kind of work, let's say, that people in your group don't usually do. Um, not quite full members of the club. Well, um, these are great hopes, um, but we know these expectations aren't always met. I'm going to start by discussing some relatively obvious inequities encountered in professional settings. Um, these will largely be familiar to you, I believe. Um, but then I'll move on to focus on a variety of less obvious ways in which people experience inequities and what you might do if you experience some of these or witness them. My focus will be on smaller groups, informal or informal, so in formal or in informal settings. So in lab meetings, committee meetings, seminars, hallway conversations, the men's room. I won't talk too much about the men's room, but anyway. I have no 
no a personal anecdotes about it. Um, at a certain point, we'll decide to shut off the video equipment, and you'll discuss what's been presented to you and your thoughts about this topic. To start off, let's review some relatively obvious ways in which people's ideas about someone's social identities may affect their professional life. First, their ideas about individual's characteristics that will affect the professional responsibilities assigned to them. For example, because it is assumed that a woman will be better than a man at selecting a holiday gift for the unit's administrative staff members, and that it will be easier for a woman to do that than for a man, a woman is more likely to be given this task. Conversely, if the unit is considering adopting a new technology or purchasing new equipment, a man will be more likely to be assigned the task of researching the options. Why is this problematic? In the first case, time devoted to non-professional service, like buying a Christmas gift, takes away from time to do the work that is important for career advancement. In the second, someone is getting service credit for learning more about something which is professionally important, the newest technologies. In addition, the assumptions about who is better able to perform the tasks may be false. I should also point out that even if a person is better at some of these tasks than their colleagues would be, the colleagues may do the job well enough. They don't have to be the best at picking out the gift to pick out the gift. They don't have to be the best at making the technological recommendation. They can just take a little bit more time to do the research about it. And finally, most of us get better with practice. So give the people who might be good enough but aren't great a chance to get better. These assumptions about what people will be good at may be based on ideas of biological difference or simply on ideas of how people have been trained, socialized, or raised, as we say. Regardless, if these assumptions are used to make different assignments which have implications for one's evolving professional profile, they are inequitable in their impact. Ideas about individuals also affect the allocation of resources and rewards. For example, if a professional of color, particularly from a traditionally underrepresented group, uh, is expected to be especially interested in students of color, which could be you know, a reasonable expectation, um, his chair or director may suggest that he attend a professional development conference about the latest teaching innovations to assist non-traditional student success. This well-supported workshop will be his funded opportunity, so he won't be funded for a research-intensive travel opportunity. He's being tracked. These days, we hear a lot about implicit bias. I think I can ask without anything on the videotape being a problem. How many of you have heard the term implicit bias? Yeah, it's sort of out there. I think it gets on MSNBC, you know, very popular. The idea that evaluations we make may be unconsciously affected by expectations we have of people because of particular aspects of their identities. It's not uncommon for identical performances or professional profiles, as in CVs, to be evaluated differently because of identities. There have been a variety of studies showing that when the identical materials are assessed with different candidates' names, sometimes associated with racial ethnic identities, sometimes with gender, they tend to be assessed differently by judges. Not always, but there's a tendency. Now, and finally, on this slide and in the obvious inequities of 2018, Inappropriate demands can be made by powerful people, and we've heard a lot about numerous very well-known men accused of sexual harassment, bullying, and even sexual assault by people in their professional spheres. These developments highlight a range of workplace inequities 
and it's exciting to see a lot of discussion and intellectual struggle around it because it's hard to know. What are we going to do? What are we going to do about giving people a fair trial? So this is very up in the air, but it's exciting that it's on the table. In the past, colleagues often discouraged or dismissed complaints about the behavior, and that response is also a focus of current activism. While I think we can see how all those ways of treating people differently are unfair, and we just need to pay attention to make sure we don't do them, there are also ways in which apparently fair criteria build in hidden inequities. These are particularly likely to be invisible to decision makers from historically, um, see now, I'm supposed to give you a different slide, sorry. Um, historically included groups um, who, who just don't know about these inequities. Um, and I give you a few examples. One is if the expectation is that the strongest applicants are those who've um, done a summer internship, there are families that cannot afford for their college student members to go off to an internship. They need that college student's income. They may need that college student to take care of school children in the family who they can't afford organized daycare for. Similarly, um, the ranking of an undergraduate institution is often taken into account when thinking about who is going to be admitted. Uh, I don't know if it still has an impact at the postdoc level, but certainly at the graduate school level, people are thinking about this. Well, if you're a Native American who lives in a reservation community, you probably do not want to live away from home for college. There are many cultural reasons why you want to stay in your community. So you, if you go to college, it will be to a, um, a tribal college for the first couple of years. Uh, you might do a lot of online studying. You will not look like you went to a great new university in the top 20. Um, similarly, if, as particularly for young women whose parents are immigrants from a variety of cultures around the world, they don't think you should live away from home when you're 18 years old. Some of them might not think you should live away from home until you get married, but certainly as an undergraduate, there'll be a lot of pressure against that, and there may not be any funding to help you along with that. Um, and finally, there are postdocs who have family ties and they cannot leave the geographic area where they have gotten their PhDs. Yet, you all know, because many of you are postdocs or have done them, that employers are going to be looking for a varied uh, profile. You've been to a bunch of different places. You're not just the student of somebody and continuing with that person or his buddy at the neighboring institution. Uh, so those are some examples of indirect inequities that most of us don't think about until somebody actually says it to us explicitly. Okay, so um, the, the question is, do people really intend to uh, be equitable and they, they unintentionally are inequitable? Um, sometimes they don't realize that what they're doing is inequitable. Um, and, and, okay, that's all right. Um, sometimes people will use what we used to call, I don't know if people still do it, I don't write about it now, a third party explanation. The example I knew about when I worked on this 40 years ago was, sure, we wouldn't mind hiring Jews, but our customers wouldn't buy from them. Okay, and, and, um, there are, there's a lot of those kinds of things. I would hire a woman to sell cars, but men won't buy a car from a woman salesman. Around the, in the 1990s, Saturn realized that women bought cars, and so actually I got a bouquet of flowers when I picked up my car. So it would start marketing to, to women. But uh, this third-party argument it, it seems to let the 
discriminating person off the hook. Um, well, I am moving fast, because that's a good idea. Um, all right, so what can be done? For most of these relatively obvious inequities, we may have in place ways of reducing their practice and redressing any damage they may cause. They may be institutional. There may be a grievance procedure in place. Uh, they may be legal. We have something in the United States government called the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Um, the existence of these avenues is important, and they shouldn't be dismissed. Some of us remember when we struggled to get them, in fact. Nonetheless, they may not be fully understood or enforced. Furthermore, people who know about these approaches to equity may be concerned about visible or hidden costs for pursuing them. For example, a person I knew who was denied tenure did not take action because he didn't want to get a reputation as a troublemaker. Um, most of these processes take time, and individuals, especially if they are un certain that they'll be successful in this, will choose to move forward somewhere else in order to regain momentum on a career track, to make a living maybe. Um, but I urge you to realize that things change in nonlinear ways and important changes happen. Examples of this are, for the people who know US history, the Montgomery bus boycott, which is an important um, Piece of the civil rights movement in the 1950s, and the Harvey Weinstein case from last fall. Individuals work together and make change, and they make change in very unexpected ways. So far, I've been talking about forms of inequitable treatment that are familiar to many of us, and we probably would all agree are meaningful and should be eliminated, or at least reduced. At this point, though, I want to turn to the center. You, you wondered when I'd get around to it, to the center of today's topic, less obvious inequities that are found in the professional workplace and what individuals can do about them. I'm going to um, start with the assumption that all the people in the loop, not in the room, but but in a, any kind of professional loop, are people of goodwill. Obviously, this is not always the case. I think we know that Harvey Weinstein was. <laughs> um, but when we are trying to build and maintain a professional community, it's important to recognize and appreciate the people who, in fact, might be well-meaning, working together to change what's going on. After a review of some common forms of inequity and potential responses, we will consider how to reduce future occurrences of these kinds of inequities. But for each of these examples, I often hear people say, isn't that trivial? Why don't you just you know, water off a duck's back? Why don't you just let it go? Just get over it. Um, but first of all, I'll say that these inequities are very well documented, some of them by 40 or 50 years of systematic research, actually. Um, and there's also research that shows that um, the disadvantages that these inequities may represent accumulate over time. And so do advantages. I'll be pointing some of them out as we go. Um, so from this position, when we know that they accrue, it's not just once, but it's over and over. Um, and even though it's not today, you're always watching your back because it might be today. Um, we're not making a mountain out of a molehill. It happen if it happens once, it's a molehill. But molehills add up. We have an expression in English about the last straw. The last straw is the straw that breaks the camel's back. 
It's just one thing. And I know that there are a bunch of these things in the physical sciences about you know, a tipping point or putting the last grain of sand or whatever. Okay, So just want to say that our culture, our non-scientific culture historically, has had a variety of expressions that show we know that small phenomena can become large phenomena. OK, um, the last thing, and we'll get to this in our discussion section with the taping off, um, is if you're good at ignoring these inequities and just getting on with it, what's the impact of making you more aware of them? And uh, sometimes the impact <laughs> is not entirely good for you. Um, sometimes it will lead people to leave the profession because it, it didn't used to bother them and now it bothers them. But sometimes it will lead people to be activists in changing the way things are. Okay, the first one it is my favorite. And that's about what my parents used to do to me. <laughs> okay. Um, a common inequity in meetings is the practice of interrupting some speakers, but not others. Interruption indicates to the speaker and others in the meeting that what's being said or the person saying it is less important than the interrupter. There are decades of research on formal and informal small group discussion that show that people with more power tend to interrupt others more. This can be power in the group itself. In other words, the teacher compared to the student, the supervisor compared to the subordinate, the parent compared to the child. Or it can be power differences related to culturally significant identities apart from the immediate context. Whites compared to people of color, social class differences, men compared to women, adults compared to children. As the results of the first studies on this behavior started to roll in, and this is in the 70s, I think, um, might have been the early 80s, um, people offered the explanation that maybe women have better manners than men. You know, <laughs> some of you are laughing because you have enough power to just laugh, that's fine. Um, um, and so that it's just that women know not to interrupt. But we find that men don't interrupt other men as much as they interrupt women. This is on the average. Some of you never interrupt anybody. And I, that's, and I interrupt a lot of people. So let's just get that right there. Um, women interrupt children more than they interrupt adults. So women know better, but sometimes they have bad manners. People behave conversationally in ways that reflect their reading, even if it's not consciously done high, um, of the power dynamics of the situation in which they find themselves. People have a range of skills, and when do they bother to use them? Why does interruption matter? If an individual is repeatedly interrupted, that person is likely to stop participating in the discussions of the group. This may lead to the impressions about other group members that the person doesn't contribute, is shy, is not a full team member. The group also loses benefits because you've included that person in the group because you hope to get contributions from that person. And if that person is now not contributing, that's a loss. Um, so what kind of immediate responses could you have? I'm going to talk about this bystander. That's sort of the current term. It's a person who witnesses something going on and it is not part of the immediate interaction, but might do something. Um, and of course, what the bystander does it depends on who the bystander is and how much power the bystander has. And I appreciate that. I want to note that. But if the bystander gets a chance to participate in that discussion, use it to turn to the person who was cut off and ask for a follow-up on the earlier statement. You don't refer to the fact of the interruption. You don't shame the interrupter. That's not too useful. 
And it could also embarrass the person who was interrupted. Um, and if there isn't an opportunity, because it just happens, they're interrupted, and you wanted it to talk, but then it was time you had to go, um, you can find a way to informally follow up with the person who was interrupted so that person knows you were listening to them and you were interested in what they might have to say. Now, if you're the person who gets interrupted, you may be thrown by this, or you might just say, oh, there they go again. Make a note of what you wanted to say. I can't imagine how many times somebody said, oh, what did you want to say, Lauren? And I say, I forget. You know, that was 10 minutes ago. Um, uh, so make a note of it so you're ready if you think it remains pertinent. Um, now, I also want you to pay attention to who doesn't interrupt you because I don't want people to get totally alienated from the groups they're in. There can be somebody who is really oafish about this and a lot of other people who aren't. And you need to recognize those people and take advantage of them, turn to them. We'll get to that. Um, well, your contribution may go uninterrupted, but unacknowledged. The speakers who follow do not refer to what you said. This could be that you made a comment that built on the earlier discussion and nobody follows up on that. You may have made a, a suggestion. Uh, people with power find that their statements are acknowledged. Um, and presumably, most people now and then say something that doesn't earn an acknowledgment. Ignoring contributions becomes an inequity when it is patterned. All of these things become inequities when they're patterned. Um, does it matter? Does being ignored matter? Um, rather like the problem of patterned interruption, patterned overlooking the participation of a group member has cost to that individual who is apt to be discouraged from future participation. Um, and by not doing that, that affects their short-term job satisfaction because it's, it feels good to say something and have people acknowledge it, and their career path costs. The group, again, loses out because the contributions are not uh, taken in. We should also note in all of these cases that there can be other people witnessing what's going on who identify with the person experienced in inequity. So if I'm a young woman and I get caught off, um, cut off every time by the senior person in the group, another young woman is going to sit there and she may identify with this and just think, what's the point? Any of you who have done undergraduate teaching know that this can be a real problem in the classroom. Um, uh, so what do you do if you're a bystander? You, well, you find ways to integrate what the person said into um, your next comment. I really liked what Sonia said, but I wondered if we could also blah, 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 whatever. Um, so you're referring directly back to the contribution. Um, if the opportunity doesn't arise, because meetings end, yay. Um, and so you can't immediately redress the, the sense that the person's uh, invisible and silent. Find a way to acknowledge to that speaker at another point that you heard what they had to offer. If you're the object of the inequity, make a note. Refer back to your comment the next time you speak. Pay attention to those who notice your participation and whatever you do, don't withdraw. Some people of goodwill may realize what they've done and will be waiting for a chance to show their collegiality toward you. Somebody may even say something to the oaf privately. But then if you never speak again, how can the oaf show that the oaf is not going to interrupt you? You have to hang in, in other words. So. I don't know if you can read it. This is when I step away. It says, that's an excellent suggestion, Ms. Triggs. Perhaps one of the men here would like to make it. So, um, and that's a cartoon from 1988. I think it says it's on the top. 
Um, I sent it to Rick. He said it would be funnier if it didn't happen sometimes. I sent it to a friend. <laughs> I sent it, but he doesn't do it. I know that. I sent it to a friend of mine who's a member of the federal bar, and she said, oh, yeah. So, and she practices now, so you know, here we are. OK. So the question is, who gets the credit for what the person says? Now, when, um, this, so it's the variation on the theme of not being heard, is when a different group member makes basically the same contribution later in the meeting without referring to the first person who made it. Others in the group acknowledge that contribution. They don't usually say, oh yeah, that was Ms. Triggs, really good. Um, the later speaker may not have plagiarized because that speaker might not even have heard it because that speaker might not be listening when the first speaker opens the mouth because that's the way it goes. Um, so the response to that kind of behavior depends a lot. It depends on the context. All of these things depend on the context, which doesn't mean you don't do it. It means it's, a, it's kind of a sophisticated set of demands on people when they want to respond. And I'll talk about that a little bit near the end, and really I will get to the end soon. Um, all right, so, um, and the last comment I make on this slide, by the way, is that if you're the person who was ignored, you, you should be noticing who in the group you can rely on, who can you trust, who can suggest to you what would be the most effective way to move forward. Because, you know, I, I'm pretty lippy, but a lot of the things I would say to people would get me in trouble. They would hear me, but all it would be would be about what a lippy person she is. No, so I need advice. Um, okay, so then I want to go on to a variation on this theme. Um, yet another one, the Matthew effect and the Matilda effect. The Matthew effect um, refers to something in the Bible, and I guess it's the God, Matthew's gospel, I don't know the Bible, um, about the rich getting richer. And uh, Robert Merton and Harriet Zuckerman um, wrote about this. They're, they were uh, sociologists science. They wrote about it about 50 years ago. And what happens is the most famous person on the team is the person who gets credited with the publication. Obviously, in the, in the bibliography, they have everybody's name. But when people refer to it in conversation or, or in some kind of a, a presentation, they refer to it as Sonia's uh, Finding. Well, Sonia's the fourth name out of seven on the list. You know, it's just that Sonia's, Sonia has money from NSF. No, <laughs> <laughs> I never apply to her program, so it's fine. Um, okay, so that's the, Ma uh, the Matthew effect. Um, the Matilda effect um, is, uh, um, was named by Margaret High uh, Rossiter, who is a historian of science. She coined the term in the 1990s. She named it to um, honor the work of Matilda Jocelyn Gage, who wrote in the mid-19th century, and one of the things she wrote about women inventors, and she talked about the phenomenon of attributing a woman's invention to a man or simply not noticing that that thing must have been invented. It didn't just sort of grow there. Um, so that, um, and I have to say that it was, it was really interesting because I, I was Googling these things to be up to date. And I hadn't read about the Matthew effect since I was in graduate school. And what did I find out yesterday? But the Matthew effect was a result of collaboration between Merton and his wife. I always thought it was just Merton. <laughs> um, Oh, I know. Um, OK. Uh, so how do you address these? You, um, a, a bystander can correct the attribution. You don't echo the, uh, the misattribution that someone else has done. If the person whose work uh, has been misattributed is in the room, uh, how you handle it will depend. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. OK. Um, so 
these errors are related to our next kind of inequity, the differential attention to individuals' achievements. We have to note that people vary in how freely they speak about their achievements. Some people think letting others know is bragging. Others just see it as sharing their good news. Individuals who feel marginal, that they're not quite full members of a group, are apt to feel less comfortable sharing the good news. But typically, at least the unit head will hear about invitations to speak, publications, awards. And there are some practices that groups choose to build in. And you can suggest this if you join a group where this doesn't happen. Uh, at the beginning of a meeting, you move around the, the room, and everybody gives a piece of, of news. Um, and you know, you're know you under the gun if you have had nothing happen, but then you talk about something that you developed for your teaching. I don't know. You do something. Um, but even when the information about achievements is available, recognition and kudos from the group uh, may be given unevenly. This contributes to differential senses of how people's careers are coming along. And it may add to people's sense of being marginal. So they make a big fuss about him, but not about him. How's he going to feel? But the other thing is everybody else in the room who doesn't really follow these guys, they don't really know them. They're only hearing about the achievements of the one, not about the other. And when the time comes to make some decisions about these folks, they don't really realize how much has been accomplished by the one who we didn't make a fuss about. So if you're a bystander, you announce achievements of your colleagues as you become aware of them. If you're uncomfortable about announcing your own achievements, speak informally with someone you trust to work out ways of announcing that feel less awkward to you. Or practice the awkward ways until you become used to them and become more comfortable doing them. A similar pattern occurs when there are assumptions of expertise that lead people to turn for professional advice to some colleagues and not others. When an indiv individual is less self-confident, she is less apt to assert her expertise and may pass up opportunities to show her expertise. Researchers have found in studying labs that among young scientists, women are more apt than men to be nervous when making presentations. Doesn't mean all women are nervous. It doesn't mean no men are nervous talking about a tendency. Young women are also more apt than young men to be subjected to severe criticism from senior colleagues in their presentations. This pattern may be consciously rationalized as mentoring, but the same degree of criticism is generally not provided to the young men. In effect, Self-confidence among young women scientists in that study actually was eroded over time in the lab. Scary, isn't it? They did it in four labs, and it's in the resources if you want to read it, and Quake. Leaders vary, and those who are reflective about how their teams work may produce a very different dynamic. That is the plan. Well. This slide says talking down, but let's face it, in the last few years, I've heard the phrase mansplaining pretty often. While this can capture a certain practice, it is actually a sexist expression, isn't it? It's used in different ways, but the way that I wanted to reflect on here is the practice of someone telling you something you already know about, and that person should know that you know about it. Perhaps they should know you know because you literally or figuratively wrote the book on what's being explained to you, or because you've spoken about precisely that subject earlier in your meetings together. There's no doubt that this happens, and I've seen it done to all kinds of people, not just to women. When I Googled it, one of the definitions I found was simply boor, B-O-U-R, great word. Um, we've seen all categories of people behave boorishly to all categories of people. However, I think it is very likely that people with more power 
are more apt to do it and to do it to people with less power. It is a way of not acknowledging the knowledge or even expertise of the less powerful person. So the way this builds into disadvantage is that it is telling the person being talked down to that her or his profile is not recognized. Another indication of inequity is whether or not others in the room speak up and correct the misapprehension of the boorish speaker. So someone should explain to the speaker, the speaker who talked down, that he has missed the boat. Obviously, that's something that you need. Either you need to have a good relationship with that person or some power before you're comfortable doing that. But you got to do it so. Um, and you should do it privately because you're modeling not being a bore. Um, another way in which we find unintended inequities um, is the different patterns of including people in informal social occasions. Whether it is a quick cup of coffee or a beer after work, these are important settings for learning about opportunities, resources, and general professional advice. Information about developments in the profession or the organization in which people work is also often circulated in these kinds of situations. Anyone who has put their foot in their mouth by saying something inappropriate because they didn't know the latest uh, knows what I'm talking about. Informal occasions are often segregated along one or more social identity. For example, people may go out for a beer at the end of the day on Friday, but some people are not comfortable in that setting or may have obligations that make sticking around with colleagues impossible. Sometimes people are uncomfortable asking colleagues to join an informal gathering. For example, and I've been told this by numerous senior male professors, um, it just, I lost it, but you didn't, but I'd like to be able to see my screen, um, that um, they're worried about how a female colleague's husband will feel if they, um, thanks. Uh, oh, but you want to go back one, I think. Yeah. Um, we don't want, once they see that one, they won't listen to me. Um, so, so, in other words, somebody who could be a very useful um, person to socialize with is afraid that it'll be misunderstood by uh, the husband of a, a colleague. Um, and, um, so um, th there's a, a um, consequence of this that I think we see, although we don't have hard and fast data on the causal link, but we do know that uh, among academics, among junior faculty, women, in every survey I've ever seen, women are more likely than men to say that more mentoring is needed. Well, if you're going to these kinds of informal events, you're getting mentoring at them. But if you're not going to them because you have to go pick up the kid or because you, you don't feel comfortable going to a bar where everybody drinks and they're kind of rowdy, um, you're not getting that mentoring. That's where the men's room uh, conversation comes in because we all know that in the restroom you get information you wouldn't have gotten anywhere else. But. Now there are powerful women in restrooms, too. But you know, the powerful people have their own restroom <laughs> attached to their office. I don't know if you're senior enough to know that, but boy, that really amazed me. Wow. Um, OK. So um, what can be done about this? Um, think about alternative or additional times and places for sociability. One institution that I um, did some evaluation for actually not based on my suggestion, but based on the insights of its leadership, um, uh, opened a wine bar in the um, faculty center. And so then instead of a place for going for beer, it was a place where people went for a glass of wine. And that somehow feels a little bit less in your face, you know, tough guy stuff. Um, 
I don't know if they have data on how well it worked. I don't know how good the wine was, so what do I know? Okay. Um, but plan activities midday when it's less problematic for those with dependent care obligations to attend. Ask people who don't regularly join social occasions to suggest alternatives that, and that might produce some ideas you haven't thought of outside the box. And keep in mind that a general invitation, come with us for a beer sometime, that just doesn't cut it. You gotta say, how about next Friday afternoon? It's like when people say you have to come for dinner sometime. Really? You ring the doorbell? Yeah, you said come, no, no. I don't think so, okay. Um, I've been talking about inequities that are presumably, boy, there's not much time to talk, um, unintentional, but sometimes um, there are, uh, people are the object, what, what are called microaggressions. How many of you have heard the phrase microaggression? It's coming up there with implicit bias. You'll be hearing it more. So one is very common one is humor. Oh, no, no, that was just a joke, you know. It was just a joke about a status that you thought wasn't even pertinent to the conversation, but that joke came in there. Um, and actually, um, it, sometimes it can be advice that's supposed to sound like very friendly advice. For example, a young single woman who I know was on the academic job market, and she was told during a one-on-one -on -one interview, and I guess now nobody goes to one-on-one -on -one <laughs> interviews. We're all afraid of them. Keep the door open. But um, she was told by a, a nationally prominent member of her profession, somebody who actually probably half of you have heard of, but I won't find out because I'm not going to name that person. This person said to her she shouldn't come to that center if she wanted to have children. So that was cool. She didn't want to go there anyway. That is a microaggression, folks. And in fact, when I told her I was using this example, she didn't say, oh, that's not a micro. Oh, great example that was. OK. Um, these are reminders that your marginality is on the mind of the speaker. Um, Dealing with these microaggressions takes energy. You're watching your back. What will be said? What does it mean? Are you making too much of it? How can you respond without adding to the problem? This interferes with doing your job. You all have to work pretty hard, I'm thinking, because this is a nice place to be. So I think you have to work really hard. You really don't need this other thing going on at the workplace. OK. Um, Sometimes the subject, the person who's the subject of these microaggressions, can opt to avoid the hostile colleague, which is frequently what bystanders will advise. And I've been one of those people in my life as a faculty member. Uh, but we need to realize that this entails making choices that no one else has to make. You have to limit which committees you agree to be on, because if that person's going to be on it, not a good idea. Uh, and maybe this is a person, one of the reasons you took this job was because you hoped to do some collaborating with this person, and now you can't do that. So it's going to affect you. So what do we put together? What can be done in just a few minutes? Jeez. Uh, it's going to be fast because the last slide is for you. Um, anybody you witness being subject to any inequities, be supportive. Help them to strategize what to do. Uh, this could be a peer. This could be somebody who is ahead of you in your career, but you witness what's going on. You have insights because you're adults in the world and you're watching what's happening. So you might have some useful insights. When you talk collectively, frame the need for change positively. Everybody's there because you like where you are. So how can we do a better job? How can we, you know, we hired her and she's feeling very shy and what can we do because she's great. Um, uh, pay attention to the context, the relations within the group. Um, avoid shaming, respect privacy, and that's of everybody involved. And involve friends of the individuals involved because friendship is an important resource for helping people get through things. 
And then you may have to explore formal approaches. You may have to talk to the HR person. Maybe you know the HR person is useless, so that's not the one you go to. Maybe your professional society has a committee um, that's dealing with equity issues, and they might have put together some useful resources for you. There are people who now consult and make money by running really interesting workshops, and I assume some of them aren't that good, but there are good ones, and you um, find out, you talk to people who are knowledgeable and find out who you can bring in to maybe do a very useful exercise for everybody. Um, and I think you've had some come in in the past who've dealt with things about sexual harassment. So that's it. Uh, we're up to the conclusions. The resources slide is later, so I think this is when we shut it off, and unfortunately we have eight minutes, but I don't have conclusions. I want to know what conclusion, what did you get out of this? I mean, I'm at a certain point in my life where if I read a book and it has one real fic, nonfiction and it has one idea that's really useful to me, I consider that a good thing. So if there's one idea that's been useful to you, that would be good to know about. Um, but it would also be good to know if there are things I didn't mention that for you, you think it's a paramount thing. Uh, really important, or if you think that I've said things that don't fit your ex experience of reality, you can straighten me out, although probably that's not the best use of your time. You can send me an email about that, um, unless you think everybody else should know that I'm wrong about that. That's different.